our primary role at this moment is to communicate uh, to the European citizens about what the European Union is doing to uh, cope with the pandemic, with the uh, crisis, but also to inform citizens about the response that the European Union is actually uh, in the course of taking in order to face the uh, multidimensional socio-economic uh, consequences that this crisis uh, has, has brought with. We had the pleasure of hosting Mr. Andreas Gettis, head of the European Parliament's office in Cyprus, to discuss the role of Parliament and the EU during crisis. From the socio-economic to the political implications, this podcast episode focuses on European institutions, Cyprus as a small state, and active civic engagement. Welcome to an episode of the Diplomatic Academy, The Conversation. I am your host, Petros Petrikos. Today we have the pleasure of hosting Mr. Andreas Gettis, head of the European Parliament Office in Cyprus. Andreas, welcome and thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much, uh, Petros, and many thanks to the Diplomatic Academy for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, before we get into our conversation, I'd like to say a few words about our guest today. Andreas Gatis has had actually a rather long and successful career. He holds a university degree in political science and public administration with specialization in public international law and international relations from the National and Cappadocian University of Athens. He also pursued postgraduate studies in the United Kingdom with a merit scholarship from the government of the United Kingdom. And he also holds a Master of Arts in Contemporary European Studies from the Sussex European Institute of the University of Sussex at Brighton. He was a career diplomat between 2001 and 2016, where he served under several roles in embassies, missions, and at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Cyprus. In September 2015, after succeeding in a European competition, he was appointed head of unit in DG Com in the European Parliament and posted in Nicosia as head of the Office of the European Parliament in Cyprus. Uh, thank you again, Andreas. Now, I'd like to begin by asking a bit more broadly regarding your work at the moment. So what are the trends and priorities in your view for the European Parliament's office in Cyprus? Well, uh, as you know, Petros, we are going through a very crucial uh, moment for the European Union as a whole. Uh, we have been facing since the beginning, nearly of the beginning of the year of this year, uh, an immense uh, crisis, a pandemic. And of course, uh, all the offices of the European Parliament, as you rightly said, belong to the Directorate General for the Communication. So our primary role at this moment is to communicate uh, to the European citizens about what the European Union is doing to uh, cope with the pandemic, with the crisis, but also to inform citizens about the response that the European Union is actually uh, in the course of taking in order to face the uh, multidimensional socio-economic uh, consequences that this crisis uh, has, has brought with. For the moment, we are communication campaigns, and these are the, the, the two priorities for, for the office. The one is the Co uh, Europeans Against COVID-19 campaign, which actually uh, tries to communicate to the citizens uh, what the European Union has done to face the, uh, the pandemic, the, the, the crisis uh, that has uh, hit us all in Europe, but also uh, the whole planet. And secondly, it's the uh, recovery campaign, meaning to communicate to the citizens the measures, the responses that the European Union as a whole is taking to tackle the economic and social consequences. Absolutely. And uh, our theme for today is in general uh, Europe's role during crisis. And uh, you've begun by addressing a very important and contemporary topic, which is COVID-19, obviously. And apart from these challenges that we see within the European Union, we see specific political challenges across the EU. So uh, when we talk about political challenges, what sort of challenges that we're talking about and it's not just the economic challenges that we see that uh, it will have in, in the long run we will basically be going into recession inevitably and it's up to the European Union and up to us as uh, member states 
to begin addressing that collectively. But what are the political challenges that we see, that we begin mm -hmm. to see across the EU? Well, in, in my view, the most serious political, uh, let's say, challenge that we have been faced with uh, at the moment is to reach a rapid political agreement around the main tool for the response of the European Union to the crisis, meaning the next generation EU, uh, as, as this has been proposed by the European Commission as the main tool to face the consequences of, of, of the crisis. And um, for me also, the main challenge here is for all EU leaders to live up to the moment, to realize that uh, this is probably the biggest challenge that the European Union has ever faced. And the citizens demand that everybody lives up to the moment and takes the necessary political decisions that will give solutions, that will reinforce uh, our economies, that will kick the, the, the economies uh, and restart the societies. Because what we have been seeing so far is that there are a certain level of disagreements within the European Council around this uh, issue. I mean, I mean, how the European Union is going to respond to this to this uh, crisis. So I think we have been reaching the momentum. As you may rightly know, uh, the European leaders uh, will have their summit, uh, a very decisive, in my view, summit in mid-July. The, the exact date has not been uh, announced yet, but uh, it, it, it will be around uh, mid-July. So there is the, it's the crucial moment to see a real political leadership by all sides from the, let's say, the member states that uh, are really uh, go along, uh, going along with the proposal uh, tabled by the, also from the so-called frugals, uh, who demand uh, a, a different course of action with regard to the, to the response of the European uh, Union. So uh, it's true, but you know, the European Union has always been uh, uh, the same. I mean, we are right now 27 sovereign member states that come together to pursue common interests. And of course, and it is expected, uh, that there are, there are uh, different uh, starting points for uh, each and every member state. But in the end of the day, the strength and the added value of the European Union is that in the end and after long negotiations, the uh, member states understand and, uh, and show their willingness to compromise because compromise for uh, the EU uh, jargon is not something, it's not a terminology with a negative meaning, but rather positive because this is the way the European Union has always been uh, advancing and this is how we go ahead. We, we are different, we are equal, we are on footing in the European Council, in the European Union, but of course we should not neglect that there are different starting points. There might be some different uh, interests in the beginning, but in the end of the day we all understand that united we stand strong uh, this is the course of action also for uh, for this juncture that is uh, quite good to hear and within those uh, different interests at the beginning as you've said uh, upon identifying them and then moving on forward and with specific reference to the uh, economy how do you think policymakers and i'm not talking about uh, uh, the heads of states here, but I'm more, I'm talking about the policymakers at the European Parliament. How do you think they might be prompted to respond? So what, what sort of options are there on the table at the moment in responding to the uh, imminent economic crisis mm -hmm. in order to minimize the impact that is going to have on member states? Yeah. Look, Petros, the, the coronavirus has uh, shaken Europe and the world to its core testing healthcare and welfare systems, our societies and economies, and our way of living and, and working together. So to protect the lives and livelihoods, uh, repair the single market, as well as to build a lasting and a prosperous recovery, the European Parliament in particular has been advocating to harness the full potential of the EU budget. So for the, European, uh, for the members of the European Parliament, this has been from the very beginning the tool, the means to respond effectively to this unforeseen crisis. 
So, the, the, and, and we are happy to a certain extent in the European Union that the European Commission, uh, which, as you as, as you know, has the right to initiative, uh, is the only institution that ha that has the privilege of proposing legislation, of proposing policy measures. Uh, so, the the Commission has responded to this call by the European Parliament and has proposed a, a very innovative tool, which is named Next Generation EU of 750 billion euros, uh, as well as targeted reinforcements to the long-term EU budget for 2021-2027, uh, 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 which will bring the total financial firepower of the EU budget to 1.85 trillion euros. It's a huge uh, financial firepower. And of course, uh, as, as you know, there are some reactions from the so-called frugal member states, but for the European Parliament, and I'm here to speak institutionally representing the European Parliament point of view here, uh, the Parliament considers that this is the, the minimum acceptable solution. So the, the next generation EU of 750 billion euros uh, is the, uh, the, the minimum acceptable for the European Union. The European Parliament from the very beginning had a more ambitious proposal because we strongly believe that we have to pull together our resources and invest for the future. In our view, in the European Parliament, we have to turn this crisis into an opportunity. And how we do this? By investing in the future, investing in the future generation, investing in making our uh, economies greener and also digitalizing our societies because the digital transformation is something that will, it is an investment for the future and we are going to harness uh, the, investment, the investments we are making together now uh, in the years uh, ahead. So to conclude, it's very crucial that the, by, by the July European uh, Council Summit, we, the, the European leaders, of course, who have the competence according to the treaties, come across a compromise. But as I said, for the European Parliament, the minimum acceptable is the initial proposal by the European Commission. And of course, the Parliament is not part of the negotiations. I mean, the, the Parliament does not have any competence in negotiating budget lines or policy areas of the budget, but has the prerogative to approve or reject the budget as a whole. So when we have the final compromise proposal by the European Council, uh, then it's up to the European Parliament to approve it as a whole or reject it. And the Parliament and the pre and President of the Parliament, David Sassoli, made it very clear to the European leaders tele summit that the Parliament is not ready to accept any solution. That, that, that is why the Parliament is insisting that the uh, initial proposal from the European Commission, uh, Commission regarding the next generation EU, but also the reinforcement of the, of the uh, current EU uh, budget uh, is the absolute minimum. Now, we do see interesting things in the making here. The institutions uh, of the EU are, well, we, we see the sort of differences that, um, you, that you've mentioned, but I want to focus a bit more again going back to the European Parliament's uh, role and specifically the European Parliament's office in Cyprus, which uh, within all these plans and the, these uh, uh, initiatives that uh, you've set up, mm -hmm. you've also led a strong information campaign in raising awareness over the European Union and engaging with the citizens. Now, I want to ask you, what do you think that the role of the citizens mm -hmm. and that of civil society organizations in general within the EU during this challenging time might be? And uh, we, I'd like to focus on Cyprus, but also go a bit beyond Cyprus and see within the wider EU scope at this time. So civil society organizations and the role of active citizenship. Well, um, you know, the European Union is, is a union of sovereign member states, but it's a union of democratic sovereign and, and, and member states. And you know, in, in democracies, the citizens are in the epicenter of all policies and uh, they, they are the, the results, let's say, of policy making. But also they, they are the ones who originate policy making. So uh, of course, citizens and NGOs, the civil society at large are at the heart, at the core 
of the EU action. And this, uh, the, and the civil society uh, as a whole is always playing a, a vital role in EU policymaking, but particularly in times of crisis, when we are faced with uh, immense challenges, also socioeconomic challenges, and the civil society at large has, let's put things more explicitly. Um, now we are reaching the moment of truth regarding the a financial response of the European Union to the crisis. I mean, the, the long-term EU budget, but also uh, the decision on the uh, proposal by the Commission, the next generation EU. Now, here we have the civil society, the NGOs in all member states that can really influence the process. How? By exerting pressures on their own governments, because as I said, are the members of the European Parliament who are, of, of the European Council, excuse me, uh, who uh, will take the, the decisions. So the leaders, the EU member states leaders, meaning prime ministers or presidents, in our case, is the president of the Republic who is going to represent Cyprus around the table of the European Council, who is going to contribute in reaching this uh, compromise. So the civil society has a role of informing their government leaders the representatives of the European Council about their own expectations. And I'm sure that the civil society has very high expectations from the European Union because um, for good or bad, the European Union has become, I dare to say, a victim of its own success. So citizens consider wrongly, of course, that the European Union has competences over nearly everything, from health to education, from foreign policy to defense policy, from trade, etc. Of course, there are competences that really are core competences of the European Union, like, for instance, in international trade, but there are also other policy areas where the European Union does have little competences or nearly very, very few competences, such as the area of health. But saying merely that the European Union does not have um, enough competences in the health sector is not enough for uh, the citizens. The citizens, as I said, have high expectations from the European Union, but now is the moment that the citizens uh, play their own role as active citizens. You rightly said that active citizenship is very important for, for, the, for the EU context. And we are living in free societies and free democracies, and, and the citizens here have a, a very big role to play. Again, by influencing and exerting the necessary pressures to come up in the European Council with an open spirit of compromise and uh, decide the best possible uh, course of action in order to uh, tackle uh, in the most effective way the multidimensional challenges that the European Union is facing. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Andreas. I have a final question, and it's also related to the very last point about the role of citizens. When we look at the role of citizens and the role of smaller states and smaller communities, and specifically I'm obviously referring to Cyprus, how do you think Cyprus as a small state, because, uh, which uh, has a smaller uh, scale population comparatively when we look at other U larger European states. How do you think small states like Cyprus or Malta, for example, will be able to contribute to the future of a common and evolving European policy over matters of public health, foreign policy and the economy? Uh, listen, Petros, uh, you know, this is a very uh, long lasting uh, debate about the small and big member states in the European Union. Uh, of course, the, the population size, but also the economic strength does matter. But of course, before the European Union is comprised of 27 sovereign member states and there, uh, no matter the size of each member state can ha have, you know, a bigger or uh, less big, uh, let's say, uh, contribution. Instead of small and large member states, I would like to refer to, let's say, more reliable or less reliable member states. Because in my view and from my experience, what actually does play a huge role uh, is whether a reliable part in the European Union. Let's take, take for this uh, Luxembourg. Luxembourg is the second smallest uh, member in Europe. But Luxembourg is uh, um, huge. 
is compared to that of, of, of Germany or France, uh, which are member states of a larger uh, size. So, um, this is concerned uh, to the politicians of, of, of our country is to become as reliable as possible because real uh, reliability will give the impetus to the strength of the of, of cyprus within the um, decision making system of the european union and of course this will will give uh, a huge plus a huge added value to our member states so uh, i strongly believe and i advocate that cyprus tries envisages the core the uh, integration process of the economic integration process uh, let's say initiative maybe there are some areas where we cannot all member states uh, work together but maybe in the beginning a grouping of uh, some member states will will uh, embark on on, on, on an x uh, uh, policy area i think it is in the interest of Cyprus to be always or try being always uh, at the core of any initiative that envisages to create uh, a momentum for further uh, unification and integration. So, in my view, it is, it is in the interest of Cyprus, not only because of its size, but also because of its geography, being in the heart of a, of a very uh, volatile uh, geographical region in the Eastern Mediterranean. I think it is in the core interest of Cyprus to be uh, at the heart of the, uh, of any endeavors, of any efforts in the future for further reunification. And uh, you know, Petros, the, the moment of truth is, is approaching. In September, pandemic permitting, of course, the, we're going to have the kickoff of uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe. This is going to be a very important process in the history of the European Union because uh, this process will last approximately two years. And uh, at this conference on the future of Europe, where not only the government, but uh, most importantly, the civil societies of member states will be represented, uh, the political parties, but also NGOs and the citizens at large, will debate for nearly two years about what the European Union, the citizens want for the future. And this is where Cyprus, in my view, has to play a very active role. Thank you. That's um, actually very refreshing to hear. And... Uh... I'm glad that we get to end on a more positive note as we see that there's a lot of things planned ahead, a lot of effort being put into uniting, into unifying the, uh, the different organizations, civil society, active, uh, more active citizens, and getting them to grasp a better understanding of uh, what the European Union is about and the, the work that the European Parliament is doing. Would you have any concluding remarks that you'd like to share with our listeners? I would like to end also with a happy note saying that um, in the European Union and throughout the, the, the history of the European integration process, we have seen that member states might start, might be starting with different approaches, uh, uh, starting points, but in the end, everybody under understands that uh, together we, we stand stronger so stronger together this is the motto uh, of uh, of the future and i'm very optimistic we turn this this crisis into an opportunity and we do this together in the european union absolutely thank you so much uh, andreas uh, it's been a real pleasure having you around and uh, we hope to hear more about the ongoing work that the uh, european parliament uh, office uh, in cyprus is doing Thank you so much for your time and thank you for having us today. Thank you very much, Petros, for the opportunity. Thank you.